So welcome everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker today, Professor Fritz Hanglein from uh, the University of Copenhagen. Um, the talk today is part of the Halmstad Colloquium, which is a series uh, where we have distinguished speakers talk about different topics uh, of interest to our school. Um, I've uh, been fortunate to know Fritz for quite a long time. Uh, I don't want to embarrass him or date him by talking about uh, all of the things that I uh, know about his uh, uh -oh. research accomplishments. Uh, but uh, when I was a PhD student already, Fritz was quite established uh, in uh, computer science and in pr programming languages in particular. And I've had the pleasure of reading uh, many of his uh, research papers, uh, introducing uh, important results, but also very elegant uh, results. Um, and uh, we were talking earlier today, and since now he is coming to talk to us in his capacity as the director of uh, research, corporate research, at a financial company. We are talking earlier today about his work already on the Y2K problem. So some of us here might remember that. And he was involved uh, back then in a very significant effort to try to make sure that the Y2K bug doesn't stop all kinds of businesses. Um, and since then, he's also been working with financial uh, insurance uh, contracts in the context of insurance. Uh, and also uh, putting to work uh, techniques such as high-performance computing uh, to solve problems uh, in this domain. And uh, more recently, uh, he has been engaged in work on smart financial contracts, which is the topic uh, for today. So without further ado, uh, welcome, Fritz. Thank you. Thank you, Valik. Thank you. Thanks for having me, and thank you for the invitation to, to uh, have me, um, you know, have me talk here about some of the things that we're busy with right now, and uh, hopefully this will go as well as the year 2000 problem. Because as you noticed, we we won, the world didn't go under. So, uh, um, so this is just the the title. So uh, I'm just updating a little bit of of these things because I'm not head of section anymore. Uh, things nowadays get or reorganized at universities as quickly as, uh, as in other organizations. So heading the decentralized systems group, um, I've been since then, I've been also acting department chair. I'm working on various kinds of committees at the university and the department. But I'm actually right now very much busy, uh, as you can imagine, um, at, the, uh, at Dion Digital, which is um, you know, a startup that's founded in Switzerland, which has its core development and research team in Copenhagen. And I'm still at the university, so formally I'll be back November 1st, uh, uh, almost full time at the University of Copenhagen. And um, so my background is uh, mostly I'm just a computer scientist. You know, I work with classical things like programming languages and systems, and um, I'm always trying to, you know, always uh, work on algorithmic and logical aspects and so on. And the applications that actually come out of this one um, is the ones that driven me into areas like e-health or, you know, processes for e-health we did previously or high performance f functional programming with applications in finance and, and uh, now back again in the area of commercial or in particular now also in particular financial contracts um, and their modeling, representation and automation. So. Blockchain is actually not in my title, as you noticed, so why not? Actually, it's, I've tried to way, stay away from that for a reason I'll get to in a second. Uh, but uh, as you can see, this is the hype cycle for 2019. And you can see what blockchain is now. Uh, so I, I don't want to discourage you, right? So it's been, when we started 2016, it's been, you know, anyway, it's gone. But it's still some things up here. Um, and, you know, um, the, the word I prefer is actually distributed ledger technology. So may maybe that's not very, uh, I don't know, marketing wise clever to use that. But uh, I'll hope to give you an idea that this is actually something substantial, an area that deserves actually attention and, um, uh, and a little bit mature research and development that uh, I think will be coming um, at some point over there. Okay. So uh, what's the, the thing? about blockchain. Um, so uh, <laughs> this is actually well known. Uh, yeah, this is from a Twitter feed from by Vinton Cerf. And I'm sure computer scientists here will recognize the name. He's one of the chief designers of 
the internet, yes, uh, he's a key designer of TCP and IP. And, uh, but the thing to know about actually Vinton here is that a very influential computer scientist in every sense, CERT was founded by, uh, by him, uh, the American uh, CERT Cyber uh, Emergency Response Team. Um, and, uh, and he used to be at Purdue University, but he's not anymore. Do you know where he is now? Well, I'll come back to this chart. So, uh, blockchain. That's this religious technology. I'll come back to this one. What's the orthodox view? So this is actually what you usually hear. And frankly, if you go into a party, and it usually will take 30 seconds to know maximum whether you have somebody who is an orthodox blockchainer <coughs> or somebody like me. You know, I'll, I'll come back to this in, in, in the end. Okay. So, uh, but it's important to remember when you say the word, you've already split the room in half. Over there and over there, okay? So uh, be aware of that, okay? So let's talk about them here now. So blockchain is a very specific thing and it's really orthodox in the sense, it's, if it's not that, it's not blockchain. And maybe that's even correct, okay? It's like saying Kleenex, if it has the brand Kleenex of it, that's a Kleenex and, and other, otherwise it's not Kleenex. And other people say, oh, sorry, well, I'm just calling this kind of handkerchief stuff uh, Kleenex, okay? And um, So what is the original one? So it's a hash linked chain of blocks of Merkel trees who, you know, just this is a check of the backgrounds, you know, for whom does this mean anything at all? Okay, sort of, that's wonderful. So Merkel trees, hash chain linked up. So it, it basically means it's a data structure. So you've heard of data structures that look like graphs and the pointers in those graphs cannot be mutated. They cannot be changed by, by a, a program. Okay, so they're self-certifying immutable pointers. Um, and for that, of course, we use a little bit of cryptography, but, uh, but that's really the extent of it, okay, um, here. So it's a data structure. We'll see a picture later on. Um, what does it contain? It's a data structure that contains something. It contains a log, you know, really a sequence of events. And, the, you know, the, the, the records in there are basically usually representing real-world events. Real world events could be a transfer of money, right? So if you think that's, if you believe the money exists, then that's a real world event. And, um, but, you know, remember it's, it's like, a, it's sometimes called a universal database. Okay, so it's one big database of a sequence of, of these events. Um, a log transaction then, you know, um, might actually, very importantly for orthodox people is, is that constitutes a validated transfer of a built-in cryptocurrency. So that means that it's just the same thing as a bank ledger. That's where the ledger part comes from later on. That says like, oh, there's a transfer of money. And that money is basically a synthetic kind of currency, okay, called a cryptocurrency. Why is it called cryptocurrency? Again, in the implementation, there's a little bit of, in the original one, there's really a little bit, and that's the reason why it's robust, of proven cryptography used. But it might be, just think of it as a synthetic currency. You know, somebody has come up with that one, but it's not really actively managing it. It's automatically managed in the sense like it pops out of algorithmic issuance, issuance uh, pro protocols and then you can transfer it. So, um, and how is it implemented? It's one data structure I mentioned. Well, actually it's replicated, okay? So it's highly, highly replicated. So the data structure itself is available in many, many copies across a distributed network of nodes. So I think of it as a computer network, they're communicating with each other, and every node has a complete, in principle, complete copy of such a list of records, okay? Now the list is, is kind of like chunked into chunks called blocks, that's the reason the word blockchain comes from, okay? Uh, now the nodes and the users are pseudonymous. Pseudonymous in the sense that account numbers. Just like if you think about it, if I show you a, a, a ledger statement from a bank, it doesn't contain the header that says, you know, here's the, the person who owns the account, but just has the account number. And it has the bank's general ledger, which means like, oh, I've transferred from this account to that account, that amount of ooh, this cryptocurrency. And then you have one after the other. That's basically the data structure we're talking about. And then you the question is like, who owns those accounts or who controls them? Okay, that's the pseudonymous part. It's not part of the ledger itself. That is controlled by somebody else. Somebody with the right access rights. Again, 
usually done by a private key. So again, that's the asymmetric cryptography that's used here, again, to make sure that, okay, the bank's money, the money is in there, but I have a key so I can sign off on a transfer and it gets checked that only the owner of the account will sign this off. Now, uh, so how many accounts can you have? How many accounts do you have valid, you know, Bitcoin accounts, I don't know, IDs? None, you wouldn't tell me, you know, <laughs> probably would say like, oh, it's none of your business. Of course, I have a thousand, you know, <laughs> people always assume that it's only one public key where they have. Of course, you know, if you're a little bit professional, you will have just like when you're a privacy freak, you will say, I don't just have one IP number. I know I have a million, right? So and I change them every 15 seconds. So that's the same thing you would do here. Of course, you would have lots. I don't know how many. The key thing is you can give yourself an account number. That's a very important part of classical blockchain systems. And who issues the account number? You yourself. So anybody who's used a system recently, you know, you just key generate. Basically, you, on your terminal, you write generate two keys, like the private key and the public key. And the public key then serves as the account number. And the, the private key you better not show to anybody, OK? So many, many different accounts. We don't know who owns them or controls them. Very likely, the same person controls one, two, I don't know, million. Who knows? That's the whole point. So, but it's pseudonymous in the sense that if somebody at some point makes the connection between a public key and valid, for example, so somehow you leak the information, you wrote it in an email, that's, oh, I have this thing, then it's not forward secure, which means like, now I know forever, I can look at the previous record of all transactions and say, oh, you transferred money back and forth. That's interesting because the other account I know belongs to the NSA. Hmm. So uh, whatever, you know, or not. Okay, sorry. Oh, this is taped. Sorry about that. <laughs> so uh, so how, how do these nodes then agree, basically? Think about it. There's a new record coming in. There's a new transfer. They're supposed to have copies. That sounds always very nice and easy, but it's actually one of the hard, it's the essence of the hardest problem of distributed systems, you could say, especially if it's asynchronous, namely, how can you make sure all the nodes agree on the next update, okay? This is why there's so much talk about the distributed consensus in this proto protocol. There's lots of different algorithms. There's a certain famous one that I won't go into that's called Nakamoto consensus introduced with Bitcoin. Um, now, at from a high level, and so I'm just giving you from a high level here, is like what's really going on is like a new block is, you know, somebody is saying, I have a new, well, a block of transactions or a single transaction if you want to, is being proposed as the next one. Okay, it's very important who gets to be the next one because the next one might be the one that says, I have all the, all the money in my account is now going to valid. There might be another transaction, namely it says all my money is going to somebody else, right? So clearly, not both of them are wa valid. So whoever comes in first, we will get their transaction validated or executed, right? By the bank. Uh, in this case, the bank is Bitcoin, the Bitcoin network. So that's important. Who comes next? So how is that done? It's all the mechanisms out there in this d domain where you can have arbitrarily many um, accounts are basically formalizations or you know, versions of $1 vote mechanisms. Since I cannot have you vote on who the next one will be, or all of us together, because you could say, like, oh, I'll give myself a million votes, right? So uh, you, you know, basically can give yourself a vote that says, uh, I can give myself as many votes as I have dollars on me. I mean, United States dollars in the sense of burning electricity off, that's a documentation you've spent a lot of dollars, or this money. I own already a lot of this money. And if I own more, I have more votes or more likelihood, it's probabilistic, of being the one who succeeds at pre presenting it. That's the story of Bitcoin, Ethereum. Any questions? I'm done. Oh, no, wait. There's also the other story. Okay. So uh, if you have questions, please do ask them. Okay. So, uh, so what does it look like if you look at uh, the Bitcoin one, so you can't see those boxes, but you can think of them as the boxes are identical in contents. That's not in accidental because they're complete replicate um, of, of a data structure. So there's a block one, which means like, you know, I think it was like a thousand transactions. You know, 
And then there's a pointer back. This is one of those hash pointers I mentioned. It's like a, the hash of this block is stored inside of this block, okay? Um, and, you know, there's a block in there, and then, you know, they always point back. In this fashion, we get a chain that's going back. And there's some that look like here somebody proposed something that I would like to be this, the next chain. And somebody else came in and said, no, oh, let's make this chain. So you have this kind of conflict. And uh, at some point, that's the consensus protocol, only one chain will turn out to be valid. So uh, at some point, when the chain is this long, these nodes will be sort of ignored. It's like somebody proposed it and thought they had a chain like this, but you know, later on it turns out, well, this block is not valid anyway. So this is actually sometimes called why it's a probabilistic consensus because it's, there's no finality. So when you, with, before these blocks have arrived, it looks like this is the longest chain, so that's, that's the state of all. But then somebody has come up with these blocks and extend them like this, then this is the longest chain, and then these two blocks all of a sudden can ignore it, okay? Uh, and that's a replication, and then there's quite a bit of traffic going back and forth and exchanging messages and, uh, and performing these operations of extending the blocks, okay? Great. Now, let's look at the other side of the room. Let's look at the uh, generalized <coughs> distributed ledger view. And at the same time, it's, it's more general um, and, and, and more high level, but I think also personally more instructive because it means there's a lot many. So the first one will be one implementation of this one, but there's many more implementations possible for this one. So I got to think of this one more as I'm saying, it's like I'm describing what a car does. But before I des described actually what the engine, a diesel engine looks like of a car, okay? And I'll try to convince you, hopefully, that that's not the important part of a car, whether it's a diesel engine or, I don't know, an electric engine nowadays, right? Motor. It's what you can do with it, okay? So it's, first of all, it's a dynamic. Dynamic means like new nodes coming in and connections coming in and dying off. Peer-to-peer -peer computer network, okay? So let's look at this one here. That's just a peer-to-peer -peer network. You know, they have nodes that, have, that know each other and they communicate with a subset of uh, the neighbors they, uh, they, uh, they can com come in con contact with. So this is a clique, but usually there's a subset you, you talk to. Um, so that's it. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. But what does it do with that network? So the concept is that uh, it behaves. So the whole network, as a, so the whole network that's in there behaves as if it were a virtual computer, okay? Like a single reliable virtual computer. So the whole network behaves like a single reliable virtual computer. Or putting it this way, it's like, imagine there's like in the middle here, there's this kind of like virtually, there's a massive computer in there, okay? But it's only there virtually because it's implemented by a peer-to-peer -peer protocol amongst all these, okay? But that's the key aspect because that's how you program it you program the virtual computer. And then the underlying machiner makes sure that it actually gets executed. So it behaves. So what you want is a programming model that this magic computer pops up in the middle, sometimes called the world computer, OK? Um, so that you program the world computer, and then the machinery underneath it makes sure that it's actually only this network. That, you know, as you said before, as I mentioned before, gossiping or various kinds of protocols make sure that this network behaves as if there were a single, single computer in there. But the key thing also is like very often decentralization, I want to emphasize this, none of these computers has a favorable role in the implementation. So imagine you're controlling one of these computers, well it's another one, and I'm controlling this one. Each one of them has basically symmetric access and control over what's going on. None of us is Amazon, okay? Because if you make this one a real computer, then you would not call this a network anymore, you would call it a cloud computer, a cloud hosted system. And then the question is, wait a minute, who's controlling this thing? Now wait a minute, they can see all the traffic. That one, whoever is controlling this one can see all the traffic going through, all of them. So if I want to send something to you, they'll see that one, they'll see, a traffic that, you know, by everybody, 
But I'm, if I'm out here, I cannot see the other's traffic. So there's an asymmetry in control and access to information. In, if you think about a standard server or cloud hosted situation. So decentralization is one of the things that say, what if you're interested in having not the presence of a third party like this, but the guaranteed absence of a privileged third party? That's an essential property that may be important or may not be important for your applications. If it is important, then all of a sudden you'd say, maybe that's not so good at design anymore. We violate the first one because we're giving all the data and the metadata to whoever is running this thing in the middle. Could be the cloud service provider. But if you manage actually to make this virtual such that all the, it looks like this in reality, that it looks, looks like there is no privileged third party and yet it works as if there were a, uh, a party. So anyway, so what does it do? Otherwise, decentralization, tamper-proof recording. But tamper-proof recording meant once you point to some information, you cannot regret pointing to that information. You will always point to that information. So the, the pointers are immutable. And that means like once it's recorded, you cannot deny having recorded later on. So a single node once asked, give me the contents of this, you know, remember there's a pointer, give me the contents that it points to. If the node returns something wrong, then the recipient can see that that's not the right data. Please give me the correct data. You can still negate and say, oh, sorry, I lost it. <laughs> Don't have it. Okay. But now we have the replication and say, well, let's ask somebody else. Maybe at least one has that data and then it's available. So performing tamper-proof recording means like can't be tampered with and there's high availability. So you cannot neither modify nor forget, delete or anything else with that information. So it's like having a, a computer like this that has a storage and the storage is purely like a read-only ledger. That's the reason it's called ledger. In, in, in bookkeeping, you know that in, you're not allowed to kind of like cross out lines. You can only add a new line. It's append only. The whole idea is it's storage that is guaranteed to only be append only. So the absence of functionality, namely crossing out, is a feature here. Okay, It's a security feature. And then, you know, the very important part and the interesting part is like, it's a computer, the virtual computer actually stores resources. So I think it was like, it's not only a, a record, but it's basically an accounting system. You can store in this virtual computer who owns what. Now, it could be crypt cryptocurrency, it could be euros, it could be digital representations of houses, but it keeps track of that and it guarantees that people cannot duplicate it. So uh, what does that mean? You can only transfer a euro or a house. You cannot copy it. Okay, that's not easy to do. You can't just, obviously you can't just copy bits. There's a little bit more complicated protocols going on to ensure that. It's quite a bit more complicated. But that's basically the essence of it, is digitally ensuring that you have linear resources. Linear like valid will understand it right away which means that uh, once I send you something, I've forgotten it or I don't have it anymore, right? So, uh, so once I send you a dollar, the first thing is like, I have to have it. So the sending will not succeed if I don't have it. I send you a Bitcoin if I don't have it. And once I've sent it to you and it succeeds, you have it and I don't have it anymore. Sounds banal, but if you think about it, that's what makes things that are information that can only be transferred but not copied, transmitted, that's what makes it a valuable resource. It's not only because you're interested in this one too, because if you know that we may or may not exchange money, basically that, that's a private business between the two of us, right? But you're still interested in making sure that we do not forge money or duplicate the two of us. So as long as you have the guarantee that either I submit an exchange to you, well, it's, and it succeeds or it fails, you'll say, I don't care because the volume of money or the number of 
items that are being managed here has not changed. That's what makes it still valuable to everybody else, that no party can duplicate it. And that was the you know, the second story. So that's basically it. So I would say that these are the characteristic properties of a full blockchain system. Very often people have use cases where they only use a subset of these. And then I would argue, well, providing something has all three fully decentralized, distributed, decentralized, fully tamper-proof recording, fully actually having resource management integrated, that's pretty hard to build. If you only, if you only need a subset of those two, in particular, if you don't need decentralization, I don't know, that's uh, easy. Just go off to private cloud provider, database will do the job for you, and you're usually home, right? Remember, once you have a situation, we need all three, it might be interesting. I would almost say that if you have a requirement that requires all these three things, you need, by definition, a blockchain or a distributed ledger system. Okay, so think of it this way. First one is like, what if we want to have a modern architecture of the, of, of, in the digital world that reflects some of the principles of a democratic system, which means that checks and balances, nobody is sort of like the dictator or a big accumulator of power, in this case, control and access to data, okay? So, uh, uh, and the second thing is, what if you need actually to convince other parties that not because I'm a nice guy that I didn't change my database contents, but I can provide, it's clear from the system properties that the information I provide is not, cannot be tampered with. So if I'm later on saying like, you know, this was the case in August 2018, people believe it because it was registered in 2018 and that is the information it could not have been tampered with. <laughs> and then as I said, you know, making sure that the system as a whole, you can still th steal things, well, let's not get this wrong. Uh, you know, I can still steal may maybe money from, from uh, you know, from Valid. Sorry, I will never do that, of course. But, uh, but you wouldn't care, right? It's like, I don't know. It's like, <laughs> it's like, figure out who's got the money, but I haven't forged it, right? So that's the thing. That's it. So what are some popular systems? You'll see these names, Bitcoin, Ethereum on the first kind. This is like, you know, the, the orthodox blockchain world. And then the permissioned, as it's called, because they're very often actually not just pseudonymous, the node operators, they will say, I need to know who the controllers of the nodes are in that network I showed. So if they misbehave, I, I don't just have like here, I have no remedy. I have to have extremely robust protocols because they have to be very, you know, Byzantine fault tolerant, as it's called. Even civil attacks have to be resisted here. But these are basically, if you know that you know, if I know where the node operator lives and I know he did something wrong, I know where you live, I'm going to knock on your door. So that is actually basically the idea of, of having simpler classical distributed systems protocols for consensus being applicable here. And they're much, much more lightweight and much, much more efficient. So people very often ask about proof of work and all this kind of energies. That's all up here, okay? None of it is down here. Well, hardly any of it. So let's. Get yes. So proof of stake. Yeah. Fit on the second part or the yeah, that fits up here. Also yeah, without Bitcoin because that's conservative. But you know, Ethereum. yeah, Ethereum and and quite a number of like I know some of you are looking at uh, Cardano, you know, and uh, that's the IOHK product or Tezos or I think uh, there's a number. Most recent designs actually they have a so-called proof of stake. And proof of stake means that. Uh, I can prove, now, whoever is proposing a block, we don't know who it is, right? But it comes with a proof of whoever's proposing it controlling a certain amount of the cryptocurrency. So think of it as owning the cryptocurrency that's stored in there, right? And, yeah. and then basically, intuitively, you get as many votes as you already have money in the system. So think of it as like, it's an old-fashioned $1 vote. Uh, okay, there is an interesting currencies over the last couple of hundred years have been backed by government. Yes. Right? And that means, that, I mean, one or two things that come I mean, A, A is it's sort of kind of impossible, uh, except in very extreme circumstances, for the currency to fail. Uh, and, and, some, and also the government decides how much money there is in the system. Yes. And when you have something distributed and decentralised, that, 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 those, those things no longer apply, uh, which gives you some interesting things which could happen. So, 
Okay, so let's let's start here. Bitcoin is one application. Yes, should we repeat the question? Yes. So the question is, how about money supply? Um, how is that managed in these various systems? Because classical fiat money system, actually the old-fashioned systems, there was gold-backed standard and so on. Uh, but nowadays you have basically a, an institution that's in charge of ish basically printing money and, and you know, unprinting money. Uh, it's a little bit an elegant way of, but that's a way of doing this, okay? So uh, um, that's what uh, our mostly, in the old days, the central banks did, sorry, the, uh, the, the governments did and the, you know, the sovereign governments, actually very old, it's like, you know, the private banks did that. Then the sovereigns, which means like really, you know, feudality found out that that's a real good business. So they made it legal for, for banks to do it and they said, I'm the one who prints the money. Okay, so there's the end of, originally it was commercial banks, and Scotland's still the case, commercial banks printing money. Um, and then, uh, you know, they thought, wow, that's very convenient, um, so I'll print a lot of money, right? Because that's a way of basically getting more of a share of the economy, because money is usually assumed to be fungible, right? I mean, in the sense that if I have $50 and you, you have $1,000, then you have about, I don't know, you have 20 times more money than me, right? Because money is money, so it's 20 times more. But then, you know, I might be the feudal. I say, I'm, I'm tired of that. I'll just print $950, <laughs> okay? Now I have 1,000. I have as much money as you. Now, the economic resources we have haven't changed, but actually my share of how much I can get control has grown up. And that's gone up. So that's the reason why we have a separation nowadays of monetary policy that says an important part of money is to have a stable value. I mean, that's the essence of fiat money, as it's called nowadays. That's not the case here. There is basically an algorithm running. I mean, it's like not a centralized algorithm. There is a protocol running that at some point prints money. Okay, that's called mining rewards. Okay, and that's specified in protocol forever. It really has no relation to economic activity. Okay, I mean indirectly through how much is being traded, but uh, it really doesn't, okay? So that's the reason why th the value of these Bitcoins goes radically up and down because it's not stable with respect to, you know, the money we have stable means like, you know, if people produce a lot, there's a lot of money around. If they produce little, there's little money around. That's the whole idea of having stable relation between, uh, you know, production of services and goods and, 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 and money. And that's not the case. It is algorithmic. So there is a couple of designs where people coming up with algorithmic, which means like no, s no human central bank, but still it should be like a, a, a trustworthy way of playing the central bank and the monetary policy, but we shouldn't be you know, relying on humans for, for two reasons. I mean, up here, this is, has a background in cypherpunk movement, which is a, 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 you know, it's an, a libertarian, um, you know, anarch um, anachronistic, I was about to say, anarchistic, uh, libertarian movement, so there must not be any authority that has, is allowed to do anything at all. So in particular, the notion of government is already something that cannot be accepted. So it has to be an algorithmic mechanism, okay. Um, and there's people trying to work out protocols for, for, for making, measuring how much act economic activities. And uh, there's very actually interesting ones that, uh, that then try to have the amount of cryptocurrency issued be stable in the sense that we think of it as having low inflation and low deflation. Basically, oh, the prices don't change of things that we buy and sell to each other. And, that's, and here it's much easier because, you know, the players are used. Uh, you actually could have that here too. You could say there's a designated player. Let's call it the central bank. And the central bank has a, uh, a, uh, a designated role. It may, it may just print money. Okay. That's it. So, so think about it this way. It's just like somebody says, um, I'm... Me, I'm controlling this public key. It's a little bit too thin. That's the reason it's not done, but I'm controlling this public key. That public key is allowed to just issue money. So I can transfer money to you and it will always succeed. That's the same thing as, as printing money. And uh, you could say, well, then you could put uh, a policy team behind it and in here or there. And there's designs for saying, like, why not have central banks issue that one? And that's a good question. There's certainly some of them are working on this one namely issuing digital cash or digital currency on, on, on any of those new ones or these systems. And th the systems that they would use for this would be for, for dollars and euros. And Swedish krona, by the way. Riksbanken is one of the more um, innovative banks in that area. 
Danish, well, I shouldn't say that, but you know. Other countries don't have as innovative national banks. So, long answer. So I'll skip through some of those, uh, but I want to get to the core of this one. So look, this is what a computer architecture looks like or a software architecture for programmers. So if you imagine you're a programmer, so um, you have a resource manager settlement layer. You know, think of it, that's the blockchain system. That is the database. Remember, it has the information and the resources stored there, okay? Then you can install programs on it. So it, it has a thin operating system. And it says, I, I want to have this program, so I'll send it in there, execute it. I'll have to provide some money for execution too, because otherwise nothing's free. But that's what gets executed then, okay? And front-end program that's sometimes called a wallet program. That's a little bit misleading, um, because it sounds like the money is in the wallet usually, right? But actually the control, the access path, private keys, they're here. The money is really here. It's very important because somebody else can sneak in and just grab it, okay? If they know your private key or somehow get it. So, so this is like one big database, okay? It's replicated. So remember, this is just, you know, representing one node. But remember, it's replicated over thousands of nodes, okay? So that, think of it as like, you know, that's a big database and programs running on it that can be invoked by sending messages to it. And if you hear the term DAP, that's basically this, okay? So th think of it as somebody's writing a Solidity code. It's a programming language for Ethereum. And then you have to write some TypeScript or JavaScript because you're running on your computer this thing here or in your browser. And that's sending messages off to the server. And the server is, in this case, any one of those nodes. Remember, any one of those nodes is a full replica of... Uh, uh, you know, the whole uh, blockchain system. Uh, so uh, there's a couple of disadvantages that follow from this one, especially if you, uh, there's a couple of advantages. This is why it's popular. Think about it this way. It's massively parallel, it's massively distributed, but the programming model is super attractive. They're called smart contracts, but that's a little bit of a misnomer. They're just programs. Better yet, they're single-threaded programs. It's like you will even let, um, I shouldn't say that here. Even first-year students will get license. Uh, usually, yeah, I would say if you, you know, if you teach us like, you know, concurrent programming, you need a truck license for that one. You're not allowed to, you know, that's a serious thing. You can run people over and they're dead. With concurrency or distributed programming, very, very difficult to get right. But, you know, sequential programming, one step at a time, single-threaded, that's like driving a small car. You can learn how to do that rather quickly, and then you're allowed to be out on, on the street and, and program, okay? And that's actually the programming model. That's the reason why it says, you know, install a program. It executes one step at a time, and, and nothing else happens in the meantime, semantically. All the other steps from other, all the other programs there get deferred until this program is done, and then another program might get executed when it you know, processes a, a, a transaction. That's the reason why it's very nice. We use hackathons, we usually use Ethereum for that. It's basically, you know, if you know Java, you know how to program this. Actually, it's in a way easier than Java. But what does a decentralized real world ecosystem really work, uh, look like? It looks more like this. So think about it this way. Now we have an ecosystem of interacting parties in the real world, you know, companies, private citizens, and we want to do this with, you know, usually we have, you know, somebody here, they have personal and private information and uh, they want to interact with each other. We usually do it by expectation according to some protocol. We usually call that a contract. You know, you better do this and I'll do that. Okay. So if you deliver, then you have a reasonable expectation. I will pay you uh, before I've paid you. But then, you, you know, that's a contract. But very often, actually, we have a third party involved, you know, if you're doing trade finance or whatever. So if you don't trust each other, you say, I'll, you know what, I'll give the money to to that person, and once you've delivered it to me, like to PayPal, you know, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, they will release the money to you. And w we do this because all two of us rely on this third party, okay? And, uh, and then, you know, there are some special ones, namely these are resource managers. These are the ones that are entrusted with knowing who owns what in the real world. How much money does somebody have? That's the banking system. Who owns a house? There better not be two of those around, right? 
this, uh, sorry, the German stuff. But uh, um, so is it better not be two registries around and say like according to one registry, you own this house and the other one, I own the house. That's very, so there has to be authoritative registries. That's the reason we have, you know, Tingbone, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and these things, uh, or, you know, a motor vehicle registry that says who is the unique owner of uh, something. And you can go there and check whether if I sell it to you, whether I'm really the owner. So we have a lot of those in the real world, trusted third parties. And uh, so let's just reflect this in a, in a software architecture. <laughs> Now, I won't go into the technical reasons why actually this makes even sense from sort of distributed systems or computing point of view, but think about it this way. Now, just replace some of those figures I had before by boxes and indicate that software, okay? But the idea is like, you know, if you have a trusted third party and you have to do certain things, let's automate them. Let's make them robotic, okay? So we had different resource managers before, like the banking system that shows us who owns what, how much money in their accounts. Um, here's the banking system, sorry. Um, this could be something else. And this could be a property registry as I had before. So something is like a database, okay. Now this could be a centralized database. Or it could be a decentralized database, like a blockchain system, or one of those distributed ledger systems. The point of those being, that's the one we trust to keep track of who owns what, okay. Pseudonymously still, since that, you know, doesn't have to display to everybody who, who has got the owner, so it could be private. Then there's a contract manager, was a third party that made sure that you know, we interact with each other. And in particular, they get handed a, a contract and say, look, you know, I don't know the contract you guys have with each other, but you give me a copy of it, and I'll make sure you abide by it. So company A, according to this contract, has to first deliver something to company B, and then according to this contract that you yourselves have signed, you must then pay and then it's done, right? So this is a generic contract manager then. It says, give me a contract, I'll help you manage it. Uh, so this is a marketing slide, I'll skip it. So, uh, so what are examples of how to do this in the real world? So if you want to have an ecosystem of parties working with each other without a trusted service provider, you know, that aggregates all the data, this is one way of doing it. So look at this, it looks the same. So you have a, this is a, an indication of something you're actually working with, it's not a product, but there are big company involved, which means it takes a long time. So, uh, um, so think about it, it's the same thing as you can see here. It just says like, you know, here's a passenger, here's a tour operator, somebody who's offering intermodal tickets. And now here's some resource managers. And the resource managers are the ones that say, I own the space on my bus. I'm, I'm issuing tickets. I'm, 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 you know, nobody else should issue my tickets, uh, but I'm managing my own database system. <laughs> and there's a contract manager, an automated system that actually makes sure that, uh, you know, um, that contract, for in this case, for getting from A to B through three different companies, um, is, is executed correctly. So it monitors the, the execution step by step as it happens. It might actually, it collects the payments and reschedules connections properly, um, you know, if and when there's a delay, for example. So, uh, uh, so, so the idea here is to, to come up with an ecosystem structure where people and companies can interact with each other like a network, so as opposed to having an aggregator, this is just an example, so it could be anything else here, right? But uh, as an aggregator that people are using, or you yourself have to go out and actually individually get all those tickets, and you yourself, if you miss the train, then, you know, I don't know, the car here, then, you know, you have to buy a new ticket and so on. Think of it this way, it's like any one of those now can interoperate with the others by just talking to their service architecture interfaces, and, and you know, basically you can buy something here that covers the whole trip. And you can have a whole ring of aggregators around them, not just a single one that uh, uh, does these things. So let's skip. So there is also, we're doing you know, the financial contracts. There's a lot of work on bonds and derivatives. That is actually a product of work now. Um, but I'll skip through because I'll force you to have questions in a second. I hope you will have at least. 
So, uh, so this is not, so when I talk smart digital contracts here, there's not the notion that you will find usually, which is a program that looks like a Java program. You will squint a little bit, you know, but the language is usually called, you know, in, in the case of uh, uh, Ethereum, it's called Solidity. Um, because we separate out the contracts from the contract lifecycle management, okay? There is a program that contract life cycles manage them. So for, for Valid, you will recognize, oh, that's just an interpreter. Yes, that's what it is, okay? It's an interpreter. So the interpreter is written once. They can interpret arbitrary contracts. But the separation has some advantages, okay? First of all, we can analyze the contracts independent of how they get life cycled, you know, independent of how they, you know, get executed by an interpreter. So basically analyzing the input to an interpreter as opposed to all the complications of you know, programming language code from an interpreter. Um, yeah. So, uh, and there's also advantages that uh, will not only go into if you, if you uh, talk to me, uh, if you ask me about is like that, that massively exploit um, by having separate contract managers and resource managers, how we can scale this up by not only having sequential execution, but having most of the execution executed in parallel, you know, in the distributed network. And, you know, as I said, we can actually make uh, precise analyses and give guarantees on the basis of the semantics. And that's actually more important than ever because these contracts are not just, they're not exchanging bits like protocols, they're exchanging money. So uh, these programs I mentioned before, they cannot be stopped. So if you have a bad program that takes money out of your account automatically, you said, oh, that's okay. You cannot stop it. So people are very much interested in uh, making sure that programs like these will not get, will be identified as rogue uh, uh, programs. Blockchain IoT contracts, I'll just mention the connection why they work together very often. This is, you know, a picture. So imagine now you have uh, something happen and you want to use a blockchain basically as a digital twin, as it's called sometimes, of the real world. In this case, you could say, um, I need two relations, namely, you should have a film here, a movie, that's the blockchain. So I think those are the events that happen. It's like a movie frame and that's, you cannot change it later on. And when you add something, there has to be consensus as to what gets added to this one, plus physical evidence. So somehow you have to associate information that makes it believable that this frame of information, this digital information, you know, it might be a picture, it might be DNA from timber or whatever, you know, something that later on can be expected. Remember, inspected, remember, it cannot be changed later on. So whoever is providing this information cannot deny having provided it later on. And the contract part is actually a, a representation of the future. Just as I said, you know, if we have a contract and something has happened, like in this case, it's a crash and it's an insurance contract, then, well, either I get the car re replaced or uh, I get it fixed. But I know one of those two things will happen. So I can analyze the future also, depending on if I know in which contract I am, in the middle of which contract execution I am. And uh, so this is, I'll just give you a little bit of peek because actually the story here is usually what I tell, but actually much of it is actually derived from what you'll see in a second, okay? So the applications are derived from this. So. Uh, the idea of having a, a compositional language, very simple, small language that says you can compose contracts from subcontracts. So if you have a subcontract C1 uh, and another subcontract C2, you could say, oh, saying either C1 or C2 has to be satisfied, that's also a contract. C1 and C2 have to be satisfied is also a contract. C1 has to be satisfied first, executed first, and then C2 has to be satisfied, that's a contract. And then there's, you know, certain events that have to happen. In this case, it's a transfer event that says A1 has to do something and send it a resource. As I mentioned, it could be a house, could be $5, could be a linear resource to, to A2 uh, at some point T where the, that has to satisfy property P here. So, you know, you can't, I can't just send it to anybody. P will say that, you know, A1 has to be me and A2 has to be uh, valid, for example. And it has to be by, by Tuesday, you know, the, the T here has to be less than equal next Tuesday. So, um, and that's it. The rest is basically just a way of saying we have recursive and, and uh, that's it basically. So uh, now the language, there's a lot of stuff hidden in, in the current deal and digital language here, but it's, it's basically, you know, you can write down expressions and constraints 
in, in a rich language, query language. But that's it, basically. So formal semantics looks like this. I won't go into this one. But what we've done is with that one is we have the semantics. We have three different semantics. That means that we have three different principles of reasoning about it. And they've shown to be, they're shown to be equivalent. And furthermore, actually, the operational semantics, which is you know, what should be done next, is derived systematically from the denotational semantics even. So this is, this is why we designed it to be correct, because we wanted this to be compositional and then you know, figure out you know, how to implement an interpreter that takes one event at a time and checks whether it's OK or not to do it. And there's even uh, you know, static semantics recently done. And the whole thing, uh, except very small parts, are um, fully mechanized in Coq. So anybody who works with uh, mechanization, like this is, uh, so this is, in other words, this is like, uh, this is ruthless. So I'm from the 90s. Rigorous, rigorous meant to me is this stuff with writing very, very detailed mathematical proofs. But mechanization is like brutal. You have to write it in a programming language which is a proof checker. So, and only if you get the proof checker to check accept it, it says, okay, it's a proof now, but hmm, uh, there's something still wrong here, then you can't get it through. So the whole thing has been developed by a master's student and by a post postdoc we have recently. Algebraic resource accounting. So there's this stuff going on here. I don't know, anybody remember linear algebra? Anybody remember your infinite dimensional linear algebra? So anybody come back to you and say, you'll never need these things. You will. <laughs> so uh, this is actually also um, developed like this. So, uh, so it's the kernel space under the sum function over an infinite, you know, of a free vector space. But the thing is like the following: is like, what is a transfer really? You know, if I'm that guarantees that I'm not duplicating or nobody's duplicating resources. It basically means that Alice is giving something to Bob. You know, so uh, there's an ownership state. You know, so this one. So Alice is giving something to Bob. It just means like, well, Alice is out of the pocket 30 US dollars and Bob is getting $30. So the characterizing properties, like if you add those two things together, it's zero, right? And that's a transfer. So even if you have three parties involved, the sum gives zero, you could say call it a transfer. It's a three-way transfer. It's like, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm out $50 and you're getting 20 and you're getting 30. It's like, you know, uh, did I give you the, who split the, you know, who cares, you know? It's like. Uh, really, who cares? You know, it's just uh, a number of people have uh, done something such that the number of dollars has been preserved. So why are we doing this one? This slide basically says because we get in very strong properties we can exploit for guarantees, for reasoning about it. Nothing gets duplicated. People are simplified. And we can actually have a, a, a blueprint for a scalable sharding uh, you know, database people call this a, a, a very general approach for splitting up the, the, you know, like a banking system, you know, who's taking care of this, uh, you know, all the accounts that Valid and I have and all the rest of you are done by two different nodes, right? So, and it, that can be done by explaining by, by basically uh, in, this, in this algebraic setting. What's next? We're, uh, and this is not only us, but, uh, but there's a number of people working this one. So authenticated nodes in our case are very important in the real world. You have to know for legal reasons. So e either I think either you want to be an anarchist, okay, w which you might be, but maybe in some other role you want to also be somebody who's actually entering into a legal contract. In this case, you must know your counterparty if it's you know, 10,000 euros or more, okay. So the users and actually who's operating those things have to be authenticated, have to be known. And that means that uh, you know, we have different designs for distributed systems that we can use. So we'll use sparse replication. Why, have to, why should we replicate? It was like, imagine you know, we had all the students in this, in this university manage actually you know, uh, this thing. is like every student would have to have a complete registry of all the world's, that's actually the case, all the world's transactions, OK? So imagine. I'm just like, oh, now let's have an additional transaction going on. It's like, wow, you can imagine what's going on now. It's like the whole campus buzzes, you know, because they all need to get information about this one, okay? And that's also why these things are extremely inexpensive. Uh, extremely, uh, expensive. So sparse replication, like structured peer-to-peer -peer systems, 
much more scalable. And uh, you know, then we can do also the parallel contract management. And we can guarantee things about you know, fairness and various properties about contracts that no matter how they get executed, it's not possible, or it is possible for somebody to cheat somebody else. So here's the final story. Remember the first one? Minton Surf works now as chief evangelist for Google. Okay, so it's probably his fiduciary responsibility or whatever as chief evangelist to pinpoint, do you need to decentralize? Of course not. Just Google, right? In that case, look at this one. It's the same one as he had before. No, there we go. Use a server or a data center hosted system. Done. But, he, you know, maybe in a different setting, he would say like, well, maybe, maybe actually it's important for decentralization. So to have a network of interoperating parties without like a flat democracy, without anybody being more in control of the data and what you can do with them than others. Well, in that case, now we're moving down this direction and then we're coming up with a way of saying, maybe we need something that needs these three properties, and that's a distributed ledger system. And, and here's some other kinds of systems that, you know, if you have a no in there, that you might want to use instead of a very expensive blockchain system if you don't need all of those. And digital contracts, they're basically a way, they're protocols for resource transfers that guarantee that, uh, you know, we can enter into a contract that doesn't just do one transfer, but basically specifies that if I pay you money, I actually get something in return. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fritz. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah. I have three questions. Yes. Three may questions. I, may I? Yeah. So, so, uh, one at a time, maybe. Pardon? One at a time, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, one is uh, uh, so you're trading um, uh, efficiency in some sense for different <coughs> flavors of security in, in, a, in a Bitcoin? Different assumptions about the network, yes. And the assumptions in this case, I'm assuming that somebody issuing ballot, the ballots, yeah, yeah. With, with, uh, I trust the, that one to not issue you two of them. So that's uh, the attack model is saying if you attack that one, then you know you have attacked the the, the identity management. Then uh, these these things will not be secure. Mm. Yeah. Okay, but th I think that was your question, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, uh, second one is uh, so each uh, uh, additional uh, uh, link in the chain is uh, voted in some sense. It was is added after a certain uh, agreement. Uh, yes, in the original. Yeah. Blockchain, yeah. That's, that's the ones over there. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Every one of those blocks is voted on. And, and then when we find out which one it is, we'll, we'll take it. Uh, and, and, and I'm hesitating a little because yeah, it's, it's, you know, as I said, it's a probabilistic protocol. Yeah, yeah. So it's not totally final at that point, but, uh, it's, but that's basically what it is. Okay. So every block has to have a universal agreement and that's the reason in Bitcoin, by the way, a single block consensus, how long does it take? I mean, Bitcoin is completely dependent on synchronicity of the network. It makes a strong assumption. So if you're talking about attack models here, it's assuming its correctness, mm -hmm. stability in a way, is yeah. assuming a synchronous yeah. system, right? So, uh, and it even takes 10 minutes per block because, you know, you have to, you know, yeah, Lots of things. stuff, yes, yes, uh, and that, yeah. That was my point. Uh, so is there but some re, uh, risk of divergence or...? or uh, yeah, that is related to this one. So the, it's known actually uh, intuitively and it's also actually you know, in certain quantitatively models uh, proven that the less synchronicity you have in your system, the more asynchronous it can be, right? You know, like, you know, messages might get delayed and you don't have now any, any upper bound for when you reach all the available nodes. Uh, the more likelihood you can have that you have divergence, uh -huh. and then these these can grow. Okay, so they can get basically instead of having a single line, and a, you know, synchronous means like there's a, a, a small like it's a palm tree, right? It's like one long stem, it's a little palm tree. But uh, if it's the more asynchronous, is the more it looks like a regular tree, like you know, splits here and splits again. And at some point, somebody dif discovers, oh, there's two different uh, 
leaves here and they, they try to put it together and then you get a competition, not how to put them together, actually, that's modern systems do that, but they'd say like, oh, one of them must die, okay? Mm -hmm. One of the branches must die. But remember, that means one of the branches all the way back dies. Mm -hmm. And that means every transaction in this one is basically invalidated. Mm -hmm. So the length of the, you know, of the, the branch from the bottom here, um, of how long it can get before it gets invalidated is basically your insecurity of is it, you know, uh, will it get invalidated in the end? So I thought I had gotten the point whatever Bitcoin for that cappuccino, right? Um, but it turns out 25 minutes later, I didn't. Okay, so that's, but the likelihood of that happening is, is kind of like exponentially decreasing under assumptions of synchronicity, okay? So the, yeah. Say the delicate task for the mathematicians uh, constructing or architecting the. Uh, oh, I, I think this. Well, I think uh, you know people don't know who actually wrote the Bitcoin protocol. Uh, it's a group or a single person or whatever, but uh, but it's definitely a uh, a uh, it's a brilliant piece. I mean, also the, I think the code is is wonderful. I mean, so uh, it's a brilliant piece, and and there's no proofs in it. Okay, that those things were done by scientists later on. Uh, and and the, the novel part about it was it was appealing to both classic computer science security and mechanisms and econ economic incentivization in an intricate fashion, fashion, okay? So the economic incentivization, which is like uh, the self-interest in building on the longest chain, because that increases your chances of getting a mining reward, because every, every time you, you, uh, you, you, you end up being the one who adds a block to that longest that's basic money in your pockets, okay? I mean, in the sense like, I am the author of that block, right? I proposed it. Yeah. So, so they get incentivized to always build on the longest one, which is self-reinforcing that there will be a single longest chain that uh, evol evolves. Okay, yeah. thank you for that answer. Just a third question. Yep. Uh, what about quantum computers? Will they, uh, once ah, they are yes. available with their uh, capacity, will so they uh, in, in uh, in for these things, I would say uh, no. Uh, so here's the reason. So uh, there is ha cr cryptographic hashing used. That's I mean, nobody knows how to attack that yet. I mean, you, you lose half the bits in, uh, in quantum computers. So, you know, 256 bits, if you have a super fast quantum computer, gets, gets you then 128 bits uh, security. That's the best attack people have right now. It's Grover's algorithm. So and the second one is that the asymmetric one, that is break, that's broken already by quantum algorithms. But think about it this way. The, that means that associating the private, finding out the private key to a public key can then be computed with a quantum computer. You still don't know who controls the private key, right? And by that time, people will do that. They will have moved their money, their crypto assets in 10 to 100 years. I don't know when it happens. They will have moved those crypto assets, presumably with a new protocol, that's not quite, with Ethereum definitely to another account that uses different cryptography, like lattice, te uh, lattice techniques or whatever, that are coming, coming online now, which are, uh, people call them quantum proof, but it means like, they're as quantum proof as like, we believe that P is not equal to NP. It's like, nobody, nobody knows how, uh, how to come up with a quantum algorithm for, for breaking those, okay. So, so I personally, I don't think that's not gonna be realistically important uh, quantum computing, because by the time it comes online, people have moved their assets into something that's quantum proof. They've just transferred the money out of their accounts, because by that time, when it comes online, they can basically steal money out of the accounts, the private keys. But you know, what if you've just moved all the money out of the accounts anyway? Except a situation where, where transactions are going on in parallel with only uh, like li you know, local ledgers and things happening, then of course you, you open yourself up to like awkward things happening, like selling the same thing to two people twice accidentally, or even worse, like you can get things like uh, deadlocks, uh, uh, where people are waiting on uh, like, like the, the 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 holiday example. Yeah. Like if, if I've booked up the plane and somebody else has booked up the hotel, then we're uh, th th then we're screwed. Uh, it seems to me that there's, I mean, I don't really have an answer, answer but I, I, I suspect that the only, you have to reach a, a sort of empirical uh, decision as to like, how, how local you can be and to, to, to what extent you, 
this is, I, don't, I don't see how this is something that you can prove what's the best strategy. It's more a question of yeah, like yeah, yeah, doing yeah. experiments and seeing what happens, how often do we have to roll back there is, and, there is. And, 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 and working out what's the best uh, uh, policy and, and the best kind of uh, topology that you... There is some theory to guide us, like, you know, there's a cap theorem that says, like, uh, you know, you've got consistency, availability, partition tolerance, level of asynchronicity. They're actually stepping on each other's toes. You know, the popular thing is, like, you can get two out of those three, any two out of those three, but not all three of them, right, mm -hmm. in a distributed system. So that's guiding us in the sense, like, if you want to make ensure that the, the users get rapid responses, yeah. availability, right? Uh, then uh, you have to give up on either, you know, you have to give up on, on partition tolerance, which means like, oh, you're just insisting that the, this network has to be really stable and very synchronous. Then you can make sure that you get consistent results, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah. answers. And so on. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, as I mentioned before, a key aspect of what I mentioned before is guaranteeing no double spending, okay? And, and you're putting a finger on this one because that's the essentially hard problem, okay? But um, you can have protocols now work with, these, with the sharding method that I mentioned before that says, like, you do not have to always use a very negative, or pessimistic approach. Um, but in many cases, you can do things in parallel. Here's a simple example, but just amazingly foreign to this. Imagine you want to transfer one Bitcoin to your neighbor here, okay? Your neighbor. Uh, and somebody else wants to transfer one Bitcoin to their neighbor in Mongolia. Okay? Happens, right? What, what does the Bitcoin network do, okay? It goes off for a rather long time to figure out which one of those two transactions should be considered coming first, okay? Because it insists every transaction has to be in a total order respect to each other, okay? And then, once it's found out one of those two orders, who cares? The effect is the same, okay? So notice that these are independent transactions that can be sharded, actually. Let's say, like, imagine all the transactions here are managed by a server here in Sweden, the other ones in Mongolia. They would just execute in parallel, okay? But if you transfer something to Mongolia, we would have basically, you know, it might go slower. So you're, you're, you're wriggling out of it here because the, 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 the question is like what structure that is best. I mean, we decide that Mongolia one area which is sharded away and, uh, and Sweden another area. Uh, but there must be some kind of, like, you must have to decide how you're going to cut the network up. I, I, I don't see at the moment a, uh, a theoretical way of doing that, no, apart uh, from, like, I mean, this is where uh, empirical work comes in, where you need to like, do, do, do analysis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, depends on the use case. I agree with you completely, yeah, and yeah, there's yeah, even yeah. theory that supports that, that says uh, it's not only because we are not, we're not clever enough to figure out what the best system is. Yeah. Well, you know, it could be also take 10, 20 years. But it actually, it's known that there is no such thing as a single best system. So some of them are better at, you know, uh, you know, um, providing consistency uh, with a high guarantee and versus availability and so on. And depending on the use case, if you do something with microparking, you know, it's like, you know, imagine you want to pay 25 euro for, uh, you know, uh, one minute of parking someplace, you're not going to wait for 10 minutes for the internet, for the network to settle on whether the 25 euro are done or not. You use a different system for that. But if you actually do a house, you use it for house deals of like four to 10 million kroner at a time, you'll wait for 10 minutes, right? That's okay. Uh, so there is different use cases that have different emphasis yeah, on whether yeah, because yeah, it's yeah, important or other things. Transaction cost needs yes. to be proportional to the transaction. That, that, that's For example, a, yes, a, yes, a uh, yes. Uh, yes. Interesting, you're pointing this out because interesting uh, because many of the algorithms here are from the database literature where data is data. So which means like the failure, the quantitative failure of being consistent is not measured. Either it's consistent completely, same bits. Yeah, yeah. Or oh, it's different, yeah, but this, but this, this but we of course know. Yes. You can see where I'm coming up. Yes. Here, that, 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 that if I was going to do research, yeah. there, the first thing I want to do is make measurements yeah, yeah. And, and collect data and see what, it, what what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. So as I said, this is a huge design space, uh, much much uh, underexplored, but interesting designs. But uh, but there's many many different designs that still need to be. Uh, executed. And I, I, as I said, I think a very important one is the one where you say, like, 
it's really not that important that you know the, cons the answer is inconsistent. It's like you know, you, from this node you get uh, your account is fourteen thousand, and from my node it's thirteen thousand nine hundred ninety nine. Right? It's like I, I can live with that. You know, it, it will eventually settle right into the same thing. But you know, if the difference is like you know, you have two and a half million kroner, and this one says like you got five hundred thousand kroner, it's like ooh, that shouldn't happen, right? So, so actually having a quantitative measure of consistency that reflects the value of what is being things done. That's actually uh, not really, uh, you know, as well studied in, in distributed systems literature as, because there it's data, it's just data, right? Um, I'm wondering why governments are so reluctant to get involved in this sort of thing, um, given that as a user, you have to trust that the algorithms are correct. You have to trust that the system will still be there in 10 years' time when you want to get your savings out. So why is it that national banks and national governments are so reluctant to start their own versions of these things? Why is it only private actors for the moment? Which if, if I weren't in Sweden, I would have said, this is a topic for a bunch of beers. <laughs> um, uh, I think that the fair answer is that uh, there's very quite different responses. There's no uniform response but amongst national banks, amongst mm. central banks, and, and, and also banks, uh, existing banks. So that is already an indication that it's not just stability. Usually, you know, it's the stability of financial system is quoted, the concerns about that. Uh, and for, you know, I'm reading up on these things and I'm studying these things for a while, so I have to say that very often is not quite clear what exactly that covers. But we have a fractional reserve system, which is by definition made to be extremely dangerously, uh, you know, volatile, you could say almost. I mean, and, um, and so, you know, and some governments uh, or central banks looking at this one as a way of bringing in more trackable, you know, digital cash, you could say, than, you know, the, the current cash we have. Um, because then, you know, they are in a situation like, I know, for example, Ukraine Central Bank is interested in making more trackable, so, you know, um, to, to mini minimize the amount of, you know, yeah, corruption that can be uh, performed there. In other places, it's not so important because you think that's not so prevalent. Um, more, you know, more interested in having privacy. B banks, commercial banks have a legitimate interest. You, no, I don't know legitimate, but they have certainly an interest in getting rid of digital cash. Sorry, of paper cash and digital cash, because then it means that they have all the money, okay? Um, and it's not just money, it's actually money they themselves print, right? So, uh, um, so, so there is, there is actually a lot of... can cause inflation because it allows the money supply to expand. Well, that's what happens on a daily basis. So that's that's, so that's what happens since the 30s, yeah. Uh, why yeah, yeah. do we accept it from a private company and not from a government? <laughs> I have personal opinions on this one as a... Uh, Computer scientist, I can offer uh, that we know quite a bit uh, that uh, will pr have to be proven and used in some settings um, to gain more and more trust. I've bought things in the US on the internet since the 90s. Most people only did it, you know, in the zeros later on. I mean, not much has changed in the web protocols that use that, but it's a way of getting used to it and getting trust into using it, okay? Mm -hmm. And, um, um, but the, the main argument I would bring against the central banks is like, there's a need for that as a possibility for that. Why should it be people with reverse caps and hoodies on that provide stable coins, which means the, the equivalent of digital cash? I, I think most people are not interested in, you know, some folks, we don't really know, sometimes we don't even know who they are, managing, being basically policy makers for, for that, okay? Yeah. So, and that's happening. So, uh, frankly, I'm sometimes there. I do not understand why there, there is no moral imperative or even a political imperative that arises out of mm. the scenario that others will do it. Okay. So this is really interesting because I think that there was a in the news there was uh, somebody saying, you know, if we don't do it, then some other country oh, yes. will do it in the last couple of days. <laughs> um, and. Um, but in this case, it's being done, you know, so anyway. And, and maybe it's already being done, uh, very, very likely, of course. But, but I think it's an excellent question that you raised, Drew, and why, why are the governments not uh, getting more involved as uh, kind of uh, active participants in, 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 in this framework? And, you know, I, I can only speculate. I think it would be a very desirable thing, it seems, to, 
to for them to at least be more proactive in this in this area. It's definitely happening now. I mean, I can tell you that, for example, Riksbanken here has been actually very active in exploring the space compared to, I mean, Bank of England has tradition for that. Maybe also because the Chinese National Bank now is very ambitious in this domain. Now people are sort of also looking at it from from perspective of well, it's competition or whatever. And, uh, and, and I noticed like in, in, in Germany, actually, Bafin, which is the financial super, uh, supervisory, they had a reputation of being extremely, I mean, like bureaucratic and conservative, but something has changed because they're very proactive now in fostering various kinds of projects. Denmark has the same thing, it used to be, National Bank is still very conservative, but, uh, but you know, the, the, the financial uh, supervisory uh, committee is, is, is much more proactive in, in working with with uh, with various stakeholders as it's called you know from researchers to fintech companies to established banks on uh, on on modernizing a secure and stable and hopefully better money system that we have now well, there was a report in the news the other day that the swedish national bank is printing more banknotes because the banknotes are disappearing and they don't know where they're going and if they accept that situation why are they so paranoid about the electronic currency mm. Mm. So, uh, this is a very good question raising uh, because uh, when I explain what a zero knowledge proof is, okay, um, I say we already have physical zero knowledge proofs. It's the physical cash we're using. So the zero knowledge proof is actually uh, a way. Isn't it? There's digital protocol, as you know. There's protocols, cryptographic protocols that are supposed to camouflage as much information about a transfer, such that. Only the one receiving and giving it knows it has happened, and nobody else can deduce with, you know, a polynomial time computer, you know, uh, that that has happened, okay? And that's exactly what cash is like, you know, it's like, hey, Valid, come here. I'll give him, uh, did I give him money now? Uh, you don't know, right? <laughs> he knows, I know, nobody else knows, right? So that's a zero knowledge proof system, and that's actually what people are worried about, actually, think about it this well, way, because it really is, it's like, and money's money, so it's, Actually, it's banknotes are trackable, but uh, and that's they're being tracked nowadays. But uh, but you know, if we just had coins, then they wouldn't even be trackable, right? Mm. So uh, gold nuggets or something. So, so right now, actually, the political sentiment is more: let's have less zero knowledge proof transactions. Let's have more. Uh, let's not have secret transactions here. Yeah, we have to show this to somebody. Mm. My actually, Real my money isn't worth anything in Sweden. You, you can't spend. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Notes, so you might well light the fire yes. because it, it, most shops won't take uh, yes. uh, notes and banks won't uh, take. It, it's, so it, it's, it's every now and again you sort of get paid some real money. You go, oh no, okay, and I've got loads of cash that I've got to somehow find a way of getting rid of. So, so yes. gone quite far in, in, in that respect. That's right. the reason people say that's the reason why the, the so-called zero lower bound is not effective anymore, which it used to be, which means like um, um, uh, interest rates cannot be below zero percent. I don't know. Do you have negative interest rates in Sweden? Yeah, we have not yet. Yes. Really? Yeah, we, yeah, oh, yeah. So, huh? so I heard a, yeah, I heard a story, you know, Switzerland, Denmark, actually Europe, too, but uh, they have uh, negative interest rates. And I heard a funny story recently, a pension uh, fund went to the Swiss National Bank and said, we want to get our 500 million Swiss francs in cash. Because, you know, then we can store it someplace at 0%. Right now we're paying minus uh, <laughs> 7, 5. We figured this one out. And apparently the Swiss National Bank said, no, we can't get it. It's like, <laughs> and then, you know, sue us. They probably get your right, but, you know, they didn't do it. So it's kind of, yeah. So, in other words, yes, you can always give it back to the, uh, to the central bank, and that's actually what they're worried about, is because you're taking the money out and you're storing it at 0%, which is a high interest rate in comparison to having it in the central bank or at a commercial bank. So, so. if I get, yeah, this happens if I sell one of my motorcycles, of which I have a, like a, a very ridiculously large, I should just put it under the mattress and be very happy. Yeah. Presently, that's that's the paradoxical world. Well, actually, nobody's been in before in history uh, where we had a con consistent period of negative interest rates. So, uh, I always do the following: it's like when I have a, I get a bill from somebody, you usually say, yeah, "You have to pay it by, uh, you know, by whatever June third." By, but what? I say, "Give it to me now! <laughs> <laughs> I want to pay it now! I want to pay it today!" <laughs> so people are not used to the idea that it's it's more valuable to pay as early as possible. Than as late as possible. Mm -hmm. It's kind of reversal of 
mindset. Yeah. Well, uh, Fritz, thank you very much for this very timely and stimulating and um, uh, inspiring talk. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what's going to happen in this uh, domain. Small. Oh, a small. It's a big. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. 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 Thank you, thank you for um, hanging on uh, as long, yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you all for coming thank today. You. Thank you.